let's start. Today we are going to continue to talk about reinforcement learning. So I'll briefly recap what we covered last lecture, and uh, then we continue uh, to talk about MDPs, and then uh, move to talk about uh, deep reinforcement learning. Okay, so last time we talked about the broader setup of MDP. So we have finite states, finite actions. We have a transition probability according to a Markov chain. We define value function, which is the, uh, the total, the expected award that you, come, uh, that you gather if you start from a particular state and you follow um, policy pi. So that's the value function. And we also define the Q function or action value function that says if you start at a state S, your first action is according to A and then follow policy pi, what would be the average um, total reward that you are going to collect. So the first question that we ask is how to evaluate the value function or Q function if you are given a particular policy pi. And policy pi is a function mapping states to actions. So as I mentioned in MDP, we focus on deterministic and stationary policy function and that's without loss of generality for MDP. Okay, so we have this uh, uh, recursive formula for the value function that if you look at the value um, function at a particular state, there is a um, reward, immediate reward in that state. And then there's a gamma, which is the discount factor. And with some probability, you are going to end up in another state. And then you compute the value function in that state. So that's true for all states in my state space. Okay, so I can write that in a matrix form. We did that last time. Uh, we defined vectors v pi that combines values, value functions in different states. Uh, this is equal to the vector r that combines the rewards in different states plus gamma times a transition probability matrix. It's a d by d, d is the number of states, a matrix. The ith element shows the probability of transitioning to S prime from a particular state S times B pi. So we had this recursive formula combining all of these um, individual recursions. So in order to evaluate it, we had two options. One is easy to think about this as a um, as just the matrix vector product equation and then solve it for v pi. In that case, we have v pi is equal to identity minus gamma times v sub pi inverse times r. And we argue that this matrix is always invertible. Uh, why is that? Just wanna see if you guys are uh, awake and following. Why is this matrix invertible? Eigenvalues larger than zero, why is that? Because P sub pi is a stochastic matrix. The eigenvalues are always less or equal to one. In fact, it has an eigenvalue which is equal to one in magnitude. But gamma is a number between zero and one. So it shrinks it is eigenvalues when you subtracted with the identity, you get an invertible matrix. But this matrix inversion can be expensive. So that's uh, what we, uh, uh, we thought to have an iterative uh, approach in order to compute the value function. Okay, so we define this operator. So this is called value um, iteration. So we define this operator L sub pi uh, applied to a vector, any vector V uh, would return R plus gamma 
times p sub pi times that vector. Therefore, this equation that I have here can just be written as v pi is equal to l sub pi times v pi. In other words, v pi is a fixed point of this function. v pi is a fixed point of l sub pi. All right, so last time I, I claimed that this operator l sub pi is a contraction, meaning that if it applies to two vectors, it shrinks the distance between, between the two. Is a contraction. And let's uh, look at the proof of it. It is very simple, but um, that will potentially build some intuition for you. So let's take two vectors, V1 and V2, in a d-dimensional space, because we have these states. And let's apply L sub pi to these two vectors and see what happens. I apply L sub pi to V1 and look at the difference when I apply it to V2. So L sub pi of V1 is according to this particular definition that we have. It is equal to R plus gamma P sub pi times V1 minus L sub pi V2. Again, it is similar. Uh, equal to R plus gamma times P sub pi times V2. Okay, so if I look at this, there are some terms that can uh, cancel each other out. So I get uh, gamma times P sub pi V1 minus V2. Now if I look at the uh, norm difference, this is a vector, so if I look at the norm difference between L sub pi of V1 minus L sub pi of V2, that is equal to the norm of gamma times P sub pi V1 minus V2. Okay, so here gamma is, a, gamma can come out, it's a number, uh, and we, we can use some inequalities uh, that uh, upper bounds this norm. So gamma comes out, so I look at the spectral norm of P sub pi and multiply it with the norm of V1 minus V2. All right, so I know the spectral norm of uh, P sub pi is actually is equal to its largest uh, eigenvalue, which is one. But here, gamma is something less than one. So therefore, this whole number is going to be something strictly less than one, let's say 0.9, for example. So that's the definition of a contraction. So when I apply L, L sub pi to uh, V1 and V2, it shrinks the distance between, between the two. Okay, so what is the implication of uh, this result? Now let's suppose I have, I start from some initialization V1, some random vector and I have V sub pi. Maybe I should, um, because I wanna say it is just an initial initialization vector for my value functions. Let's apply L sub pi to these two vectors. What is going to happen to the result? So if I apply L sub pi to V1, Okay, first let's say, if I apply L sub pi to V sub pi, am I gonna get a point here or here? Or somewhere else? The same point, right? Because it's a fixed point. So if I apply L sub pi to V pi, it's going to remain the same because that's the fixed point um, uh, solution for L sub pi. Okay, now my... Uh iPad froze. Hmm. Did the pen die? No, pen didn't die. Okay. Oh, okay. Now it works. We are back. <laughs> 
now if I apply L sub pi to V1, am I gonna get a vector um, here or am I gonna get a vector further away? Closer, right? Because it's a contraction. The, this point remains the same, so the other point should get closer to it. So if I apply L sub pi to it, so that's my V2, which is L sub pi of V1. Now if I keep applying that, So eventually I'm gonna get closer and closer to my fixed point. Then I can recover my fixed point by this iterative application of L sub pi. So they get closer to each other at each iteration and eventually it will converge to L sub pi. So this simple concept is actually referred to uh, as Banach's fixed point uh, theorem. See, it's a very intuitive concept, uh, even though the name may be a little bit complicated. So it, it is true for any Banach space, but you don't need to worry about the definition because you're working in the Euclidean uh, space anyways. So therefore, if you give me a policy pi, so I'm going to do the following. I'm going to randomly initialize a vector in D dimension because I have these states, then my value at iteration r plus one is going to be just L sub pi, my value at iteration r, and L sub pi is nothing but r plus gamma times P sub pi times the old value function that I have. So I have an old value function, I apply this, up, this function on it, get a new vector, new value vector, and I'll repeat it maybe when the difference between the two iterations is less than a small number, then I'll stop. And that's the uh, value iteration uh, in order to um, iteratively compute the uh, value of a particular policy. Okay, so let me see if there are any questions. Is this clear? So if I give you a policy, you can compute it. You can compute it as value. Either in closed form, if your matrices are small, or using this really easy iterative approach. Okay, so let's carry on. Now I'm going to talk about optimal policy. Okay, so what is an optimal policy? Right? So potentially if you can think about the definition that I wanna pick a policy that maximizes the value function because the value function is the expected reward that you collect if you follow policy pi, so you wanna maximize it. Okay, so what is uh, wrong with this formulation I wrote here? Or is there anything wrong about this formulation? What is the dimensionality of V sub pi? It's a vector, right, in D dimension. So what are we optimizing? So re remember, so our optimization techniques, we always look into a scalar function and we pick maybe a high dimensional variable to maximize or minimize that scalar function. But now I have a vector. So which vector is better? So let's say maybe I have a vector, uh, here I have two, here I have one. So that's my uh, V sub pi sub one. And I have another vector here, it is lower, but the second component is higher. So which one is better? 
right? So I see a suggestion. It says do an element-wise max. Okay, so maybe we can do that. We can element-wise max. Maybe we can find a policy that specifically maximizes the particular element of V sub pi. It means when I start uh, in state S, then what is the best policy that I should follow? So here, how many optimal policies I'm going to have? Because for every starting state, I'll, I'll need to have a one optimal policy. So all together with this approach, I'll have the optimal policies saying that, okay, so if you start in this state, follow this particular policy. If you start in the other state, follow the other optimal policy. It's a big headache. Right? So you, because the optimal policy will be a function of the starting state. Okay, here um, the majestic Bellman comes to risk rescue. So Bellman in 1957 showed that for an MDP, Markov decision process, there exists one optimal policy that is deterministic and stationary such that this optimal policy is optimal in every coordinate for every S it is better than any other policies, better or equal. So it doesn't say it is unique. It may not be unique, actually. But if you have two optimal policies, they are going to lead to the same value function. If pi 1 star and pi 2 star are both optimal, then V pi 1 star is going to be the same as V pi 2 star, which we refer to as V star. It's a non-trivial result because the starting state may have mattered. What Bellman showed, it actually doesn't. So there is an optimal policy that is optimal in each of the coordinates. So I don't need to worry about having the optimal policies depending on the state that you start. Okay, any questions? Okay, so if not, let me carry on. Now the question is how to compute an optimal, such an optimal policy. So before that, I'm going to uh, address some intermediate questions and then we'll answer the final question, which is how we can compute pi star. Some intermediate questions. So let's say I give you V star. I give you, okay, I, you know, let's say I have a genie, it gives me V star corresponding to the value function for the optimal policy. Can we compute Q star, which is the optimal um, uh, Q function? or action value function. Okay, so let's look at the definition. So Q star S and A is defined as max over pi Q of S and A. 
Okay, so let's uh, substitute the definition of Q function. So we have max over pi. What is the Q function? We have the uh, reward that we collect plus gamma times with some probability, I'm going to end up in S prime. Remember, the first action is according to A, right? So in Q function, we are not following policy pi at the beginning. After that, I'm going to follow policy pi. That's why I have V pi of S prime. All right, so this term doesn't depend on pi, neither this term, neither this term. So this max, therefore, can be brought in. So I'll have r sub s, r, r of s plus gamma times s prime, p s prime given s and a, max over v pi s prime. And what is this? Max over pi. That's my v star, right? So that's the maximum value that I can get if I follow policy pi star. So this is just v star of s prime. So therefore, if I give you, if a genie gives you v star, so you can just multiply that with your transitions for a given a, and then compute your q star. Really um, easy computation. OK, so let me see. Um, if there are any questions. OK, so let me turn the table and ask, what about the other direction? If I give you Q star, if I give you the optimal action value function, can you compute V star? From the above equation, okay, so let me rewrite this. So we know V star, we have a, we want to compute V star of S. When in V star, we are following a particular policy pi, pi star. So in Q star of S and A, we have this flexibility to take one action according to A and then follow, follow policy pi star. So we have a little bit of a, a bigger room in the first step, right? So the first step doesn't have to follow policy pi star. So therefore, if I look at max of this over A, over all possible actions, I have a little bit more bigger room here. So of course, if this A is the, the, the arc max of this optimization is according to pi star, then I'll have equality here. But in general, I may have more wiggle room because I have some more freedom in my first action and then I follow policy pi star. Right? So in general, you may think that this is an inequality. But it turns out that uh, it is in fact equality. And that's called Bellman's, again, optimalities. That says, now if you look at this max over actions over Q star of Q star S and A, that is equal to your V star of S. And in fact, the arc max of this, if I look at the A that maximizes the right hand side, that is pi star. So this is really, really. Uh, important, and you'll see uh, why. So therefore, if you have V star, you can compute Q star, and 
using this argmax, you can compute pi star. So if I have any of them, then I'm fine. So I, I, um, I can compute the other quantities according to uh, these arguments. Okay, uh, any questions? Is everything clear? Are you going to prove this now? <laughs> the proof is not hard actually, but like um, um, there's a, we, 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 we have a limited time, so I'll skip the proof. The proof is actually quite easy. So to get Q star, we also need R and P. Yes, so far we assume we know the rewards, we know the transitions. That's the, that's the setup. We know everything about the problem. Uh, later today, we are going to relax some of them. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, now we are ready to compute optimal uh, policies. All right, so the first uh, approach that we are going to introduce is something called value iteration. If you look at the, um, uh, this equality that we have, let me actually rewrite this. So we have V star of S is equal to max over A, Q star of S and A. What is Q star? Let me actually open this up. Max over A, I have R of S plus gamma times, with some probability I'm gonna end up in state S prime, and then I'll collect V star of S prime there. Okay, so the key idea of uh, value iteration is that you see here, I have another recursion. So I have V star here and I have V star here. So I'll start with some random vector for V star on the right hand side and update V star according to this equation and keep going. Easy peasy. Right, so let me make it a little bit more um, rigorous. So we define an operator L of V. Here we are looking at max over pi or A, doesn't matter because um, uh, it's an element wise max reward vector plus gamma times pi sub v times v. So if you give me a vector v, I'm going to compute L of v according to this uh, maximization uh, over pi, and this is an element-wise maximization. So it is obvious from this above equation that V star is a fixed point of this new operator, L sub V, L of V. So very similar to the proof that I showed before, uh, there we have for the evaluating a policy, we have L sub uh, pi. So here you can also show that this L function is contraction. L is also a contraction. 
you do this practice at home. Um, it's, you know, simple linear algebra. So I think it's a good practice. Therefore, if I apply L repeatedly, because it's a contraction using Banach's fixed point, I'm going to converge to my V star. So therefore, V star can be computed by repeated application of L. So in other words, as I mentioned, it's a very simple uh, method. You start with a random V, update V according to this equation and keep going. So you have um, with a um, random V, let's say at iteration zero, it's a d-dimensional vector. And then your V in iteration R plus one is just according to that equation we have above, which is the same as um, this equation that I'm writing here for completeness. And repeat until, for example, the norm difference between these computed in two different, uh, two subsequent uh, consequent equation, uh, iterations is less or equal to a small number. Right, so that's the algorithm that we have here, it's called value iteration. Then I get V star, I can compute pi star or Q star if I want. This is the first reinforcement learning algorithm that we, we have here. Now, you, if you give me rewards, if you give me transition probabilities, then that's it. If I'm in an MDP, I can use this really easy to compute my optimal policies. Okay, so let me uh, pause here and see if there are any questions. How do, the, uh, do we define L? L is defined according to this equation. In other words, you start with the V, you plug in that recursive equation and you iterate in order to compute uh, your V star. And then you can compute pi star and Q star if you want. Just to make sure that says repeated applications of L Yes. Okay. Um, so we extract Q star to get the optimal policy. Yeah, like you have V star, you, you can compute pi star and Q star as before. Okay, so that was the first approach. Let me uh, talk about another approach. It's called policy iteration. So here we directly optimize policy. Before we are working with the value function and then we compute V star and then based on the discussions we have, we had, so we compute pi star. But here we are going to directly uh, optimize the policy function itself. So let me uh, first uh, explain the algorithm and then uh, explain why it works. So we start with a random policy. 
let's call this pi zero. And then we evaluate this policy. I compute the value function for this particular policy. How can I evaluate this policy? I start with some policy. How can I evaluate the policy to compute its value function? Compute V. So how can I compute V sub pi? I, I just want to make sure you guys are awake. value iteration, right? So we talked about it, right? So you either use a closed form to compute the value of that policy or you use the value iteration in order to compute the value of the policy. Okay. Um, and then using this value function, I'm going to evaluate the Q function. I'm going to evaluate the Q function. I'll just use the formula that I have, which is equal to the reward, initial reward, plus gamma times with some probability. I'm going to end up in status prime times the value for that. Now I have this Q function for the policy that I started with. Now I'm going to find. I'm, I want to update my policy. I want to improve my policy. I'm going to find for which actions Q is being optimized at a particular state. Then I'm going to replace that action in my policy function. So find the best action. be taken at state s. So in other words, I'll look into arc max of this q function that I have. Let's call this a star of s. And then I'll update my policy using a star of s as new action that I want to take at, um, at uh, state s. Let's call this pi prime. And then I'll just replace pi with pi prime. And then I'll repeat till the conversions. This is called policy iteration. So you start with the policy, you compute V and Q for that policy, and then using Q, you can find the optimal action you wanna take in a particular state, and then you replace it, if it is not the same as before, you replace that action in your, um, in your policy and obtain, uh, update your policy. And that's it. That's the uh, policy iteration. It does actually converge. Policy iteration is guaranteed to converge. an optimal policy. 
in practice, it usually takes um, less iteration compared to the value iteration algorithm. So that's why um, in um, many practical scenarios, people prefer policy iteration compared to the uh, value iteration because it converges uh, faster. So you start with the policy pi zero, you first do policy evaluation, either using closed form or uh, the value iteration algorithm, you compute V pi star, then you compute Q and corresponding A's, replace it with your policy, you update your policy according to that, you get pi one and you uh, repeat this until conversions. Okay, so let me pause and see if there are any questions. So these are like two classical um, reinforcement learning methods to compute optimal policies for, for an MVP. See, it's really easy. Right, so either you're using Bellman's uh, recursive equations, either you start with the value function, update the value function, uh, and then um, after finding V star, you compute pi stars, or you wanna directly update your policy. When you start with the policy, compute V, compute Q, with Q compute actions, and then replace those actions in your policy to um, update your policy and repeat them. So two uh, very important methods and we have um, convergence for both of them for a discrete uh, finite MDP. Uh, some part of it I proved, some part of it um, I'll let you guys to uh, look at the proofs. Any questions? Uh, there's one question, why policy iteration when value iteration is uh, faster. Uh, no, no, as I mentioned, policy iteration, in practice, it converges uh, faster with less iteration compared to the value iteration. Uh, what if the state is continuous? That's a great question. So I'll um, address that in a minute. Hold on to that question. Do we also assume that policy is stationary and deterministic. Yes, here everything is stationary and deterministic, so I'll uh, relax them uh, bit by bit. Any other questions? Are value iteration and policy iteration still used in research papers? Um, or are they considered to be obsolete? So um, if you uh, hold on to that question in a minute, I'll show, in fact, policy. The reason I started with these classical methods uh, was not because you know, they are obsolete or not. So these are actually foundations for some of the uh, modern deep reinforcement learning methods that we use in practice. You see immediately that, for example, policy iteration can uh, is actually is a foundation for many of the uh, modern reinforcement learning methods. So hold on to that question for a second so that will uh, be clear in a minute. Uh, there's a question, this is only for when the model is known and uh, dynamics can be used, otherwise Monte Carlo. Can... Good question, so I think all of the questions is that, okay, so these methods are in a very restrictive setup, like we have, uh, discrete states, we have discrete actions, we know the transition probabilities, so on and so forth. So how can we use this in practice? If you wanna use it in uh, more realistic scenarios, these assumptions may not uh, hold. Uh, so these are very good questions to transition to the next part of today's lecture. Uh, to relax some of these unrealistic assumptions. Relaxing some of unrealistic assumptions. Okay, so let's um, 
So above we have this uh, method policy um, iteration. We first we evaluate v pi, then compute q. So let's even assume the rewards are functions of states and actions. It really doesn't change the complexity of the problem. And for simplicity, I'm just going to write uh, the summation as an expectation over S prime when S prime uh, is according to distribution, my transition properties, P S prime given S and A, V pi of S prime. So we compute, remember in the policy iteration, we have, uh, we have a policy, we evaluate V sub pi, then we compute Q sub pi according to this, and then we improve the policy. And here I'm going to uh, relax the um, uh, stationary assumption. So I'm going to look at the arg max at time t, so I'm going to take action a sub t, I have q sub pi, st and at. So I can use a t star in pi to obtain pi prime. This is my updated policy. Okay, so let's see what are the limitations in this framework. So the first limitation, as uh, one of uh, you mentioned, is the state space. That's probably the most important limitation. Here we assume the state space is discrete. And the number of states is um, small, right? So we can, you cannot have like um, billions of states. If you are in a continuous setup, even if it is, a, let's say, a bin the, the states can uh, be binary, um, then the size of your state space can grow exponentially um, in uh, D. Even if you quantize, you know, with very coarse quantization approach. So this is the big limitation. So we wanna relax this limitation and have a method that not only works uh, with discrete states with you know, large uh, alphabet sizes, but also with continuous spaces. So one uh, issue is how to represent the value function. So if you if your um, the number of states is really large, you need to have a lookup table. And so if you if your number of states is like um, billions, you need to have a function, a lookup table with like billion entries. And whenever you want to write or uh, store your value uh, in that particular state, you need to update that uh, particular part in your lookup table, and that can be very expensive. But is there another way to store or characterize the value function? Can we use a neural network to do this? to represent V of S. Yes, we can, exactly. So that's the, um, one of the key ideas of deep reinforcement learning, to use a neural network to have a parametric function of, uh, for the value functions. You start with your states, 
And now let's say your states are in whatever dimensionality they may uh, they may be. Uh, so I'm going to use again D, but like don't you know um, this D is different than the number of discrete states. Uh, let let me actually use another uh, notation. Maybe I'll use um, capital D. So here D is the dimensionality of uh, representation for each state. It's a continuous uh, vector potentially. Then you are going to have a neural network, whatever your favorite neural network is. And then eventually, you are going to have the value function for that particular state. And remember, value function is scalar, so you have one output. That's uh, really uh, nice uh, for us. And let's call phi as the set of parameters of this neural network, like all the weights, all the bias terms. Okay, now let's see how we can uh, train um, the model by, uh, instead of using a lookup table as my uh, value function, I'll just use a neural network. How we can uh, train and compute the uh, sub phi. We are going to use the same equation as the poly situation. That's why I started with those classical methods. We have an old V, meaning that we have an old phi, and then we are going to use a recursion to update phi. That's it. So uh, you start with an old, if I by old, I mean like coming from the previous iteration. Uh, and then you're, you're going to do the same thing. You are going to compute Q. Uh, how can I compute Q? I'll use this equation that I have, gamma, expectation expectation over the transitions that we have. I'll just put old here just to emphasize. I compute Q. And then um, I'll iterate. But the, the, the thing here is that I should fit um, this function. There should be a loss function in order to optimize for uh, my parameters phi. So I'm going to use uh, this Q function. If I maximize over A, I'll get an updated V, V function. And I'll penalize the difference between my new V function and my old V function. Fit V sub phi to what to the max of Q sub pi S and A over A. As I know, this is like my updated V. And I'll use a, maybe a quadratic loss in order to do this optimization. So I'll define a loss function for my parameters phi, which will be V uh, sub phi of s minus max over a particular action, then my q function, q function is computed with my older, um, older v. So I'll update uh, my v sub phi based on that target and a quadratic loss. And then iterate. So you start with an old V, you compute Q, and then with Q, you can compute this maximization. Actually, hold on. Can we compute this maximization? I, I relax the assumption that S is discrete, but I haven't relaxed the assumption that my actions are discrete. So this can, I can just numerate. I'm still, I still assume actions are discrete. 
I'll take care of it later on. So I'm assuming this max can be computed with using old V. So I have this target. So this is my target. And then I'll optimize phi to be closer to that target. So because this is a maximization similar to the policy iteration I'm updating at each step. Oh, yes, there's a summation over S, of course. Okay, uh, any questions? Congratulations. You learned about deep reinforcement learning. So uh, here we have a deep neural network to represent my value function. And basically, we plug in into our uh, policy uh, iteration method. OK, so similarly, I can parameterize. Instead of v function, I can parameterize q function. we can parameterize q function instead of the v function. Let's call again these are with phi. So I have a function, q function, that depends on a state and an action. And I can do the same thing. I can um, compute uh, v by maximizing Q over a particular A, that will be my target. So the reward plus gamma times the expectation of V sub phi of, let's say, SI prime, that's going to be, let's say, my target. And then I'm going to minimize over phi the difference between q sub phi si and ai minus this target using a quadratic loss function. Now I'm basically directly uh, optimizing uh, for q. Right? So I don't have um, I don't have a maximization here, I have a maximization to compute V sub phi. It's like hidden there because to go from Q, so here you compute an updated Q, but then you need to compute V, so you do the maximization there, and then you compute updated Q, and then that's your target, so you optimize the uh, quadratic loss between the two, and you iterate. Okay, so, so far we, relax the assumption that S is the, the state space is finite. No, we can use a neural network either to parameterize V or Q, and then we are good to go. But what about the transition probabilities? Here we need to know transition probabilities from a particular state, if I take a particular action, my environment is going to take me to a sperm. Actually, why do I need to know that? Where do I use these transition probabilities? In the expectation, exactly. So this V sub phi, it's just a maximization over A. So I don't need any probabilities to compute uh, this from Q. So we need this because of this maximization. to compute that expectation. So in practice, it is very difficult to uh, know about these exact transition probabilities. I'll, uh, in the next lecture, I'll uh, talk about some approaches to uh, model the environment or the transition probabilities. Those are called model-based RLs.
you model the environment. But in many cases, that's difficult, right? So you don't um, want to, the environment can be very complicated to model. So in that case, there, there's a branch in RL called model uh, free RL. That doesn't directly model the transition probabilities, but approximate these expectations by generating samples from the environment. So assumption is that you have access to either a simulator or your robot can generate one or more samples. So you use approaches like Monte Carlo or some approximations in order to approximate these expectations. For example, the simplest possible case is to generate one sample according to your simulator or your dynamics and approximate this expectation using just one sample. Right? So you cannot go simpler than that. One sample approximation. So remember that the issue is this expectation of my next state. So I'm in state S, I have, I, I'm taking action uh, A with some probabilities, I may go, go to different state S primes. So that's the expectation over. So I'm going to approximate this. It's a very um, crude approximation. It's just like one realization of my dynamics. I'll just, I, I say, okay, so just take action A, see where you end up. You end up in S prime and just evaluate the value of that function and use that as a proxy for this expectation. And this is just max over A, which is the, remember everything is here computed by using the Q function. I have a Q function, SI prime, A prime. So I have a Q function. I um, uh, take one step, I end up in state S prime. And that's the approximation I'm going to, and then I optimize for, for A to, um, to compute B. So that's the approximation that we are going to use here uh, instead of the actual expectation. It's a very crude approximation, I agree, but um, that's something that we won't require to uh, compute, um, or model the environment. If you wanna, if you have more resources, maybe you can generate more and more samples and uh, have this um, expectation um, be more accurate uh, with respect to this empirical estimation. Uh, and you know that's something that people are doing practice. So this is called Q learning. So basically model, um, it's based on policy iteration. It's a classical method. Then we relax the <coughs> states to be continuous. You can represent the value function or Q function using a neural network and update parameters of the neural networks. Uh, the, the only the difficulty here is that we need to know transition probabilities, but we don't know it in general. So what we do is to generate one or a uh, few samples and approximate the expectation according to those samples. Okay, so let me uh, just say one, uh, one thing and then I'll uh, take your questions. Still, <clears throat> we have one key limitation here. Right, so I'm assuming I can go from V to Q easy, Q to V easily by computing this maximization, right? So, uh, in Q learning, I have Q, then I compute V, I approximate this expectation, I have this target, then I have this you know, L2 loss, I approximate it. But the assumption here is that I can go from Q to V quite efficiently, and that relies on the assumption that the action um, is, uh, the action, action space is uh, discrete. Okay, so my iPad is, is again frozen, so let me, Repeat what I did before. 
Okay. So what happens, how can we deal with if um, we have continuous actions? Okay, so there are two uh, approaches, broadly speaking, to deal with this. Approach one to use a function class that maximization over A is easy. Such that because at the end of the day, this is the bottleneck. I want to compute the max of Q S and A. If this is easy, then I don't have any problem. For example, <clears throat> this paper by Goethal, they consider like quadratic functions that this maximization can be done uh, quite easily. So I don't have any, um, any uh, difficulty in going from Q to B. So another approach is to learn another network to approximate the maximizer. So we, we, we need to compute this max. Learn another neural network to uh, give me this approximate A star. Uh, I don't have to get, solve this maximization uh, every time. So I can just use that network. And this is uh, work uh, proposed by these people in 2006. So in other words, if you plug in, in any of these um, uh, solutions um, in the approach that we have, you now we relax the assumptions that states and actions are discrete, so they can be continuous. And using uh, uh, the sampling approach, the model-free RL approach, we relax the assumption that we need to know the transition probabilities. Therefore, you can actually take this algorithm, which is very simple, and apply it to very uh, practical uh, scenarios and see how it works. Okay, so that's all I have uh, for uh, this part. Uh, next lecture, I'm going to uh, talk about another class of methods to compute optimal policies for deep reinforcement learning based on gradients, because we have been talking about gradient descent, gradient ascent approaches. But these approaches are not based on gradient uh, computations, right? What, is, what are the bottlenecks that we didn't use uh, gradient descent in order to compute optimal policy? So that's something that I'm going to talk about it next lecture. And if we have time, I'll talk about uh, model-based uh, RL a little bit as well. So let me pause here and see if there are any questions.